The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and saw where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Last month, I was sitting with a gentleman down at the Coffee and Donuts after Mass downstairs. And by the way, Coffee and Donuts is returning after several weeks off uh, after Mass today. Very exciting. But I was down there talking to this gentleman, and we were having one of those great Dunkin' Donuts that they have down there. And uh, he says to me, you know, these donuts are really great. But if you want a really good donut, you've got to go to Aroma Joe's and try one of their chocolate donuts. Those are the best. And he was very passionate. I'm talking to my side, really. should go try that sometime. Well, a couple weeks later, he, um, uh, he, this gentleman sent me a Christmas card. And in the Christmas card was a gift card to Aroma Joe's and a big message that said, make sure you try the chocolate donut. Well, after that, you know, what could I do? I mean, it would be ungrateful at that point not to go and get a chocolate donut. I mean, the gift, it, it was already paid for me. And so I, uh, I went and tried the chocolate donut out. And it was uh, pretty good. Most chocolate donuts are. Jesus, in our gospel today, uh, he's very passionate in talking about John the Baptist. When he talks to his own disciples, Andrew and John, he says, you know what? God has done through me is pretty great. But what God is about to do through Jesus, that's the best. That is what is re God really is preparing here. So go and follow him now. Uh, he, he is the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. In calling Jesus the Lamb of God, John the Baptist is not talking about food. He's not saying, you know, go to Jesus if you want the best lamb chops, like you go to Aroma Joe's to get the best donut. He's saying that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, just like they sacrifice lambs in the temple and, and to try to get right with God. So Jesus is going to be sacrificed on the cross one day. And through that action, we are going to be made right with God. We're going to be healed. Relationship with God is going to be healed in that great gift that we call salvation. And so what Jesus is about to do is pretty important. So you should go follow him. And to their credit, they do it right away without asking any questions. Immediately, they stop following John and they follow Jesus, probably because they trusted John the Baptist at that point. They've been following him for many years, and they saw he was a sure guy to help them get to God. And so if he said it, they were going to believe in that. But they didn't, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They had never met him before. They didn't even know where he was going to be staying that night. They asked him, where are you, teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and you will see. At first I thought, well, wow, Jesus is really asking these disciples to trust in him. They don't know him, and, and he's not even telling them where they're going to be staying that night. But then I realized, well, maybe Jesus doesn't know where he's going to be staying that night. The birds of the air have their nests, the foxes have their dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I don't think that Jesus is just asking these disciples to trust in him. He is inviting them to participate in his own trust of the Father. Jesus puts his life in the hands of the Father completely and trusts in him for everything, trusting that he is going to provide their daily bread, trusting that he's going to provide them a shelter for the night. And it says that it's already four o'clock in the afternoon when this is happening. If Israel is anything like New Hampshire, it's already getting dark at 4 p.m. this time of year. And so the time is getting short. They better start praying pretty quick here that God provides a shelter for the night. And 
Where they go, I don't know. They, they meet Simon Peter, so maybe they end up in the home of Zebedee, his father, or maybe that's the night they go to Simon's mother-in-law's house, or maybe they end up just sleeping on the fishing boat. I, who knows? But they place all their... I, who knows? But they place all their trust in God, trusting that God will get them where they need to go, provide for everything they need. A relationship with God always has to start with trust. Actually, a relationship with anyone always has to start with trust. We have to, if we don't have that initial moment of trust, uh, then it, it's hard for anything else to happen. It's hard for the, the beautiful friendship that God wants to have with us to, to continue, to begin, for God to give us all the gifts he has prepared for us. But unless we open our hearts up in trust, in that initial trust, it, 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 God can't give it to us. And it's just amazing for these disciples. It just keeps getting better and better what God wants to do for them. They're already following John the Baptist. He's like the second greatest person ever. Now they're following Jesus, something even better. It just gets better and better. It doesn't have to happen that way. There was a, there was a uh, pastor in a church, and he was uh, announcing to his congregation one Sunday that after many years at that church, he was going to be leaving and going to another church. And after the service was over, an older parishioner came up to him and said, uh, well, pastor, I mean, nobody is going to, whoever comes in next, there's no way they're going to be as, as good as you are. Oh, nonsense, said the pastor. He was very flattered by this compliment. Uh, no, really, said the parishioner. I, I mean, uh, uh, I've been here for 50 years. We've had five pastors. Everyone has been worse than the last. So, uh. <laughs> with, with Jesus... It's the opposite. Everything gets better all the time. It's better and better. The teachers get better. What God wants to give us gets better. But unless they were willing to, to uh, have that trust in a new teacher, be open to the new things that God wanted to give, it, it, was just, it was just hard for it to happen. Just because uh, someone told me about a great chocolate donut doesn't mean that I ran right out and tried it. In fact, I waited for the price to be paid for me, for the gift card uh, to be given to me. You know, Jesus doesn't promise that it will be easy to follow him. He doesn't promise that it will be without cost. But he does make it as easy as possible. He's, he just asks for our trust at first. Everything else will come later. And if we can trust in Jesus in that moment, then everything else will be provided for. He will pay the price. That's what it means that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Just like the, the Lamb in the Old Testament at the Passover was sacrificed so that the people could live. The Lamb died so that the people didn't have to die. And Moses said, well, well uh, sacrifice the Lamb, take some of its blood, put it on the doorpost of your home so that when the angel of death comes, he'll see that well, blood has already been shed in this place and he will pass over and go to another place. But in order for that to work, all the people had to be safe in the house. And so Moses said, well, also take some of the flesh of the lamb and roast it and have a great meal together, a great celebration of God's love and care. And eat that lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, just like the Jewish people do every year at the Passover. The, the bitterness of the herbs reminding them of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt that they were escaping from. The, the unleavened bread because uh, they, they were in haste. They didn't even have time for the bread to rise. They had to quickly be on their way to go to the new promised land that God had prepared for them. Well, so in the New Testament, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is sacrificed on the cross. He dies so that we can live forever. His blood pays the price for our sins. Jesus, uh, St. Paul today says, never forget that you have been purchased at a price. God has paid the price for you through Jesus, through the sacrifice of Jesus. But it's not enough that Jesus just died on the cross. We have to share in the meal. We have to share in the banquet that Christ has given us. That's why at every Mass, we come together in the household of God, and we eat the flesh of the Lamb. We eat the body of Christ. At every Mass, the priest holds up the unleavened bread that has become the flesh of the Lamb, and the flesh of the Lamb and repeats the words of John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How blessed are we to be called to the supper of the Lamb. Jesus invites us into this meal. John the Baptist is talking about food after all. He's just talking about a very special food, the food of the Eucharist. 
that we receive at every Mass, when we see how God gives us everything, God gives us this free gift of salvation, God gives us uh, the gift of His grace, we, we have to receive it. We have to respond with the gift of our own life, a gift of, full of thanksgiving and praise, a gift full of faith and hope and love. That's why St. Paul says, you know, you have to glorify God, even in your body. You have one purchased you at a price. We are called to, to do that. Just because I got this gift card to Aroma Joe's doesn't mean I had to go and spend it. I could have forgotten about it. In fact, I, I was giving some gift cards at Christmas. And I started wondering uh, how many people use these gift cards, and I looked it up, and it turns out that like 10 to 20 percent of gift card balances are on uh, on the balance at all times. Six percent of gift card balances never get used. Uh, retailers profit to the tune of some five billion dollars a year for unused gift card balances. That's why they love to sell you a gift card, and they'll ship it to you for free because. Uh, we're paying the price for uh, this gift card. And people just forget about their gift cards, or they lose them, or they use part of it and leave the balance, or the, you know, the gift card expires, the gift card has restrictions. The gift that God gives us never expires. But we do have to cash in on it. We do have to, God has given us this gift. We have to, we have to use it. And how many people hear about the good news that Jesus has died for us, that Jesus has risen, that Jesus has shared God's life with us, but they, they don't respond with the gift of their own life. How many Catholics know about the great gift of the Mass, the great gift of the Eucharist, but maybe they stay away from the Mass for whatever reason. Some better offer comes up. Thank you for coming to Mass today. We do it whenever we can. I mean, sometimes we can't. We're sick. We had a major snowstorm last week, but we do what we can to come here because this is the way we give thanks to God for all that he has given us. We didn't have a very good way to say thank you to God until he gave it to us. Even our thanksgiving is itself God's gift. God gives us this great gift of the Eucharist. Eucharist means thanksgiving. And this is the way we give thanks to God for all that he has done for us. We participate in his own sacrifice, his own total gift of himself to the Father. And so today, let's say thank you to Jesus for all he has given us. Let's say thank you for all the people who have given us so much in our life, who have sacrificed for us, who have given us the faith, who have given us love, who, who do so much in ways that maybe nobody even knows about, but Jesus knows about it. So thank you for all the gifts, all the sacrifices you make in your life as you seek to follow Jesus. It all begins with that initial moment of trust, but it continues in a lifetime of relationship, a lifetime of love and service, a lifetime of praise and thanksgiving as we give thanks to God for all that he has given to us.